So I'm going to start off with a quick story, uh, which I want to contextualize this, this lecture in really. It's, it's called The Case of Maddie. Um, and where Maddie's story comes from is that many years ago, I was diagnosed with schizophrenia and spent some time uh, in the mental health system before being put in a community for said to be treatment resistant psychotic people. And it was in that place that I would claim that I became unmad, if you like. So my distress and the, the so-called psychosis began to not be present and certainly not cause distress. And, and um, years later, as I started doing academic study and, and professional training, it, it's been really important to me to hold on to what I learned in that place of living with seven other uh, people who were said to not, not be likely to do too well. So I'll just read it. Maddie. Maddie would arrive in a shared space in the house and ask for the machine to be turned on. The machine was in the middle of her back, a place that she could not quite reach. Any one of the people in that room at the time uh, might turn this machine on and this would have a significant impact. Um, she'd sit down calmly once the machine was turned on in the room and often we'd be sitting there with the television off uh, just as a group of people um, and, and suddenly Maddie would say, the television's turned on, the television's turned on. Um, God's telling me that I'm the cat murderer and my sister Sarah said I buried the rat in the garden. This was a phrase she would say. She was very worried about this and very worried about people being angry. And when this occurred, Maddie would ask any member of the, the community then to stand up and turn the machine off. Uh, and the reason I share this story was because when that machine was turned off, she'd calm down again and then leave the room. And in the context of Maddie having a diagnosis of schizophrenia and uh, being seen to be treatment resistant, this could be easily seen as a psychotic phenomena of God talking to her and unusual realities happening and particularly including others in those states or, or, or realities. But what has crossed my mind over the years is whether Maddie was simply trying to find a way to be safe in an environment and having come into an environment where she was the only non-male and uh, thought it was safe, but then suddenly felt overwhelmed. She'd ask us to interact with her in a way that could calm things down, i.e. turning the machine on. Then the silence or the tension might become too much for her and she'd start having what we might call hallucinations or experiences. She'd ask someone to help her, they'd help her and she'd calm down again and then leave. And I suppose what it, it demonstrates is it's a lot about how we define her experience. Uh, as to whether we decide she's got a psychotic experience or whether it's an anxiety or a challenge in an environment. And that's a lot about what the sociocratic is about. So I'll, I'll carry on, but might refer back to Maddie at some point. So originally this, this approach was about making contact with psychosis uh, and a humane approach to witnessing the, what, what I would call the person and the coexisting human connection. So what happens, the witnessing of what happens when two people are in a room and the threat is no longer present, does that change the experience between the two people? And is human connection able to increase? I presume for most people here, that's not an unusual concept. concept. Um, so then it begs the question, what are we doing when we say that someone's expression of the unsafety initially is a, is a mental disorder or, or symptom of mental disorder, when we could actually create new environments and see people having different methods and means of being able to express themselves and therefore not looking as psychotic as they might have done beforehand. And with that in mind, the paper that sort of starts off this work, that's not published, it's coming out soon, but it, it's just a quote from it. The interconnected that occur, interconnectedness that occurs through the process of growing within a loving, non-goal-orientated relationship leads to a negation of the need for an altered state to exist to defend the threat of annihilation. And that's really setting up what I'm gonna talk about. And if we just break that down, we're talking about the mutuality of being in relationship. Um, Mary Duig, a mentor of mine, talked about therapy being a, an act of love. So we're talking about how do we create what is loving between people as humans? Um, how do we avoid going to goals and interventions when we don't know what else to do? So the goal, the only goal is towards relationship. Um, and how do we avoid um, putting people in a position of threat so that they need to put uh, psychosis between us? Well, this is sort of the answer, I suppose, in, in my view. And what does that look like? Well, you can see in this context here that we've got trauma dissociation meaning, and I'll unpack that, and nothing in the way in the middle of human connection. And in those interfaces of those different dilemmas, 
uh, we have what we might think of as psychotic. So we might think of voices or visions or beliefs about situations or people that are not necessarily true uh, to others. Uh, and, and those are, are what I'm suggesting is that those are the things that are being placed between the person in distress and the person who's supposed to be helping. Um, because that's what we've then got to relate to. We can relate to the trauma, dissociation and meaning in their lives through their expression of this as what's currently referred to as psychosis. To contextualise that then uh, and to think away a little bit from the kind of trauma only model. This is uh, sort of taken from Lang's work. I'm interested in R.D. Lang and some of his ideas. And we could also re really sort of collaborate this and talk about instead of trauma, we're talking about ontological insecurities. People's insecurity of existing in this world, which is often about relationship and environment. When the insecurity becomes unsafety becomes so profound in a person's life, they might move towards a state of nihilism, ceasing to exist, ceasing to feel safe enough to exist. And certainly Lang talked about this in the divided self, that that's when we might see those uh, so-called psychotic phenomena emerge. And instead of meaning, people find their ways to disconnect on a human to human level. Uh, and again, that's where we see these expressions of this dilemma uh, in, in a so-called psychotic state. If you want to understand it another way, we could look through a this is a slightly poetic license here required, but you could look through a Freudian lens and you could say that the superego is, is the position of dominance that creates trauma and threat in people's lives and bad things to happen in people's lives. Uh, the id is the kind of um, uh, the dissociative or, or response that people go into this libidinal energy that overtakes them in response to the threat from the superego, the trauma, the adversity. And the ego is the sort of meaning making how do we kind of try and balance out this threat versus this response um, and again this is what people are putting between uh, themselves and the supporter in a way to ultimately keep the supporter away from them because they're frightened of that relational dynamic so i'm just going to jump back a couple of slides to here in the context of trauma dissociation meaning one of the things that's really interested me is how we use trauma now as universal language uh, but of course, that doesn't always encompass all the experiences of people's lives. So a little bit of theory to sort of back that up. The power threat meaning framework talks in a much broader context from the classic traumas and neurobiological adaptations and talks, talks about the operations of power and how that's manifested in the broad range of people's lives. Um, the work of Bernard Gurin talks about the bad things that happen in people's lives. And I think the idea of the bad things that happen is perhaps a lot more useful for the everyday person than, than the language of trauma that's often taken in and medicalized. Uh, but if we are going to use the medical language of trauma, Andrew Moskowitz, who speaks incredibly on this area, talks about trauma being the thorn in the spirit. And I, I think that sort of really serves for a purpose here. So whatever someone's thorn in their spirit is, is what we're talking about as trauma. And, and I'm just contextualizing dissociation. I'll talk a bit more about it, but we've accepted dissociation as this absolute thing for most parts in, in mental health uh, and other environments. But of course, dissociation wasn't initially necessarily a psychological process in any way. So if we look at dissociation around the context of psychosis, Martin Dorahe in New Zealand does incredible work and actually describes it just being a phenomenological difference, the voices in people said to have schizophrenia and the people said to have dissociative identity disorder. And I think that's a really important journey we're exploring is, is, is there actually any difference between dissociation and, and psychosis? And I, I would obviously say not. Um, Morton Prince talked about this, a great author about voices being dissociative in the um, early, early 20th century. And so it's interesting that we're now coming back around to explore this idea further. In terms of being, I just want to include the ideas of Viktor Frankl, uh, of meaning, sorry, of Viktor Frankl, and how we can kind of develop meaning in the context of incurable suffering. Um, as it, so, so this broad experience that it's about the person's meaning and not the meaning that's impressed on them. Um, and Lang, of course, talks about the idea of people having meaningful responses, uh, uh, sane responses to insane circumstances. And that might be how the meaning gets generated in that context. So going back to the idea of dissociation, um, I just wanted to kind of set the dissociation component up. And dissociation is to sever the association or connection of 
and especially cut off from society. So this fits with what I'm saying is that people, although they may have to be in a room with me uh, because they're in distress for a variety of reasons, they may feel compelled to do so. They may still want to um, cut themselves off from me. Um, and further down, we see from dissociere as a part participle, we can see that it's to separate from companionship, disunite or set at variance. And if we think about what happens when someone is very distressed in an extreme state, is they're often setting themselves at variance and companionship from others. And mental health services and systems often decide their responsibilities to bring people back into relationship and companionship. And I'm, I'm absolutely supportive of that, but I suppose to sociocotic ideas are about exploring um, how we can do that and, and, and what we mean by that. Just to pose a sort of question I suppose to put out there, I was at the um, International Study Society for the Study of Dissociation and Trauma last year, their conference, and there was an interesting discussion about this is dissociation, this is dissociation, this is dissociation, and then someone said, oh, but bipolar, that's a completely different beast. And I was really interested in this narrative because it's, we start to talk in literal terms about things that we aren't, cannot be specific and literal about. And I understand that's about language use, but we could see bipolar as an explicitly dissociative process. It certainly sets itself uh, companionship and disunites us and creates variance uh, to many common things in other people's lives. Um, same with suicide. Uh, and even addiction, people get into very absorbed states about the experience of suicide or, or even addiction. If you've ever had the experience of being addicted and chasing the journey of ensuring that your addiction is met, met there's a very absorbed experience in that. And I wonder why we don't consider further the uh, dissociative nature of that, um, which is a, a really important aspect for this, this model, really. Um, so then it comes down to how people understand it and what people think of it. And this incredible book by Dr. Noel Hunter um, was talking a lot about trauma and madness in mental health services. What meaning do we make? What do we not make? And this quote, I think, sums it up, really, when we're thinking about whether someone's in a psychotic state or dissociative uh, and how we're going to respond. We often need to think something around. Often the difference simply boils down to who can frame things the way that the professional wants to hear or agrees with. So we can see that in mental health systems often when people become very skillful in describing their experiences in a different way and that creates a different response, perhaps from the same professional um, that was responding to them in a different way when they express things differently. And this is, the, for me, an important part of us trying to remain open to not needing to know the answers. We don't know, so we don't need to pretend we know. And for me, the bio biomedical diagnostic led systems are inherently about having to find answers at some level because then we introduce treatments. So whilst others may disagree with that, um, it, it's not the experience of people with lived experience for the most part, in my experience, uh, that, that people aren't focused on, on finding out the answers and getting to a like, label and a treatment. That seems to be the mainstay here. Uh, so then people become very skillful at articulating what's going on for them to manipulate the professionals. But it's a skillful manipulation, of course. But what does that mean if we say, well, if they were psychotic, they might not be able to do that. But if they were dissociative, they might be more able to. And so it really starts to beg the question, what, what are we actually talking about? And is there a difference? Everyone will have an opinion, I'm sure. So we get on to the main sort of theory and concept. What is dissociocotic? Well, I should tell you that tell you the true story, really not to undermine it, just for transparency. I was really interested in the hearing voices approaches and uh, Professor John Reed's uh, neurodevelopmental model of psychosis, which shows us the similarities between the traumatized brain and the so-called schizophrenia brain. Um, and actually we can include in that the brain that's had uh, copious amounts of neuroleptic drugs. And we see some primary same changes. So I was thinking, what is it that means that we can't see beyond, oh, this person's psychotic and this person's not, when actually people are, are just having different expressions. So we make up stories that, oh, this brain change shows this or this brain change. And I thought, what if we were allowed to call it something different so that we didn't have to get involved in what it definitely was when we actually don't know? 
So I thought, okay, well, it seems a bit like dissociative and it seems a bit psychotic. So let's call it dissociocotic. Um, and it was all about a sort of need for a new language and to move away from the totalitarian and deterministic positions, which is the mental health system at the moment. Um, for the most part, you need a diagnosis to get a treatment pathway in the mental health system. That is a, a totalitarian position in my view. Uh, and it's also deterministic because then we talk about disease course, et cetera, et cetera. But there's not really any justification, I would say. And then, in fact, Lang said that determinism and totalitarian was the um, end of freedom and death to the soul. So if we're taking that position to someone who's in distress and can't make sense of their realities, are we really offering them an opportunity to make sense or are we sort of hammering home that their inability to make sense is how it is forevermore? So it's a very sort of humane, human, humanistic approach. So what is the sociocotic? It's the experience of animation and giving life, important, to being a variance of companionship to self, so separating self off from self, uh, for the survival of the self in relation to the interpersonal threat from the other. So I separate myself off from my conscious state in order to survive the threat from somebody else. Uh, and, and, it, and it's a very animated process. And the reason that's important will become apparent from now. So then it becomes about a dissociation and one aspect of the, of the of, of, of perception, sorry, one aspect of the perception difficulty here is that traditionally we've probably thought of dissociation as something of a losing consciousness and shutting down uh, beyond the fight, flight, freeze process um, so that we, we see it as a kind of down regulation process. And what I'm saying here is that psychosis is actually potentially an upregulation in, in a dissociative state. So it's this kind of perceptual thing. And on the right hand side, you've got Rubens vase and face. And of course, the theory behind that is that we have difficulty to hold two perceived images at the same time when the outlines are, are similar. And if we use psychosis and dissociation and the population that access mental health systems, most people who have ongoing and, and, and um, difficult so-called psychotic or schizophrenia type conditions, um, are, are suffering with a life of adversity and trauma and misuse and operation of power and bad things happening. So why is it that we don't look at those things first? Uh, and I think the, the difficulty is, is that we, we have a perception that there is those people who've had trauma and difficulties and then there is those genuinely ill people. And I really think it's important to say from my view that's nonsense and unsubstantiated. Um, so, so we need to sort of challenge our perceptual challenge, orientation around this. Um, what's the value here? And I suppose the value is that when we can start to hold our perceptual experience differently and see that there is two images, there is two experiences, there is more than one potential reality, and we can really hold that, then we can start to observe what's making that happen for the person or what threat I might actually be creating to that person. So the person that comes into a session in an agitated way and gets calm or the person that comes into contact with me within a calm way and then becomes, becomes agitated and we say, oh, there's the emergence of the psychosis in a stress. Well, let's look at what the stress was and what it represents and think about whether that's a kind of dissociative response rather than saying it's this sort of bio condition that uh, we have to then treat out of people because actually that shuts down the opportunity for much of the work that might occur. In my view. So just to explain this then, and you'll forgive the drawings, my daughter and I did them. Um, we have dissociation, it's a freeze beyond freeze for ease of language. So once upon a time, uh, we had a sort of limited development of our conscious processes of our brain, um, and we were operating on a much more uh, innate response level um, than we currently do. And the threat at the time was from an animal. So we had animals and we had humans, and if we were in a fight mode and we needed to survive, we tried to kill the animal. Uh, if we couldn't do that, we might run away a little bit. Uh, if we froze, we, um, we, we might do that and hope things happened, but we might also not be able to survive, so we played dead. Um, and there is a bit of poetic license in here for ease of presentation. But this is the kind of dissociative position where we play dead. And if we accept that a, an animal needs to chase and prey on its, on its victim, uh, when we play dead, it might have less of an innate response to that and it might run past and we might survive. So that was the mechanism that we might think of as a shutting down and playing dead of dissociation. Then things changed 
and we adapted to the new threat and a different brain, if you like. So in the different brain, we've now got a more nuanced and, and uh, available way of processing what the threat is, what the conscious threat is, and how we might consciously like to survive. But there's also the, 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 the availability for that sort of unconscious loss of consciousness and dissociation to arise. And of course, what's changed is the threat is different. You can see on the right hand side, it's no longer from an animal. For most of us, uh, uh, in, in, certainly in, in Australia, the threats are not from animals anymore, they're from people. So the brain's changed and the threat has changed. Um, and that's a really important point here. So if we feel threatened by someone and we start fighting with them in a fight response, uh, that doesn't work very well and we get arrested or we get detained. Uh, potentially if, if we want to run away um, we can try and do that in the flee response but of course um, there's a range of ways that this doesn't work anymore and just to bring it into real context of mental health uh, we now have between most states and territories this agreement that if someone runs away from a community treatment order the other state can continue to apply the treatment that was decided in another state until an assessment has been done so this idea that we could actually run away has become even more difficult. So the fight, flight, freeze process is less available as a, as a meaning way, full way to, to escape a fear from the other person. So we might freeze, but of course we become a sitting duck. And I would even suggest that at times people are said to have catatonia in this freeze state, although I think that's a whole other story. Um, so if we go to the old model with our old brain, uh, we would then freeze and dissociate and lie flat on the floor. But just as the threat, our brain's ability to perceive this has changed, so the threat has changed and the, the person doesn't run past. If I lie flat on the floor now looking dead, someone will come and revive me. So that threat doesn't work. So our brain has developed this incredible response. And instead of lying flat and playing dead, that doesn't work anymore. The way to keep people away from us is to display psychosis. So cool. So some of you will think this is mad and not true, of course, but if we think about going into the street outside wherever anyone's sitting now and there's someone screaming at voices that no one else can hear, some of us will go towards them potentially, but most of us would not really want to get involved. We might be quite overwhelmed and threatened. And that's what I was talking about at the start. People are putting between them and me what is going to create safety between them and me but actually that's what i've got to work with and that's what i've got available to me to be in relationship with and to understand so what does that leave us with well it, it, it does give us a question what does it mean that the psychosis is not only understandable but a gift and opportunity for humane connection well i'm going to step you through this so you don't need to read the small slides um, but it does give us an opportunity to think about what would it be like to have non-psychosis as well as this person being said to be psychotic? And what is it that's making me want to get rid of it? And the obvious answer is, oh, people are in distress and, and um, it's overwhelming for them. But if it's a survival mechanism, an innate response, then we need to be more nuanced in how we respond to it. And we might actually stop asking them to be able to get through that and ask, what is it that I'm doing that's making this happen? I also want to just mention here that one of the things the Hearing Voices approach has given us is this real knowledge from lived experience and, and from professional experience about what is gift, opportunity, metaphor, meaning in the presence of voices as a, a sort of response to adversity and emotional social conflict, rather than simply being this kind of symptom of a mental illness. Um, and I think some of the resources for this, if you don't know, things like the film Crazy Wise gives an incredible descriptor of sort of cultural uh, narrative meaning, uh, particularly in indigenous and tribal communities versus the Western model that says this person's in distress and it's a problem, uh, this person being like that, to the, the indigenous and tribal community saying this person may or may not be in distress, but there's an important message coming through this experience. Uh, and I think that's what we're trying to understand here. So if we can start to understand those meanings, we don't necessarily want to get rid of the psychosis because first we want to be as skillful as we can in understanding why it's present. And I'll just give an example from my own life. When I was 13, I had my first so-called psychotic experience uh, following a range of traumas in my life. 
and I'd recently, not long before, left the church and, and wasn't going to church anymore and was starting to be quite what people would call rebellious. Um, and then I was in a classroom and this enormous entity came through the wall and was going to swallow us all up and I hid under the table and everyone caught on fire and I was screaming and this very fire and brimstone experience which was extremely frightening. Anyway, the response to that by the school, and it was 30 years ago so things have probably changed little, uh, they took me to the sick room and left me there and then at the end of the day I was allowed to go home and no one was told and it was very weird and probably Matt being naughty. Um, and it wasn't until some years later that I would have some more unusual or altered states, which would then be labelled as psychosis and schizophrenia in the mental health system. But one of the journeys that I've been on is to think about what, was, what might have been the meaning of me expressing that distress out loud. And I do wonder if, as I'd left the church and I'd been abused in the church, was I actually trying to say to people, I don't know how to say this, I don't know how to articulate this, but this madness is, is trying to tell you there's something not right here. And what would have happened? Would I have saved people from further harm? Would I myself have saved myself from many years of secrecy and denial and deception um, by having that madness looked at in a, gosh, it's most unlikely that someone would suddenly become psychotic. So I wonder if there's something behind it. And that's really what the second half of Dissociocratic is about. Importantly, uh, there's something about setting this up is that one of the things Lang said that's really important here is that it's not about you knowing what the other person is experiencing in their experience. It's about knowing what I experience in the descriptor of the other person. So when someone describes their experience to me, I don't actually feel what they're feeling. I feel what I'm feeling in response to their, what they're feeling. They also are experiencing what they feel about my responses. So this idea that in any given moment of a session, someone might notice something in us that we might more simply call transference, but I'm, I'm talking slightly differently to that, the classic transference anyway, but a, an action, a behavior, an experience in the room might, might precipitate somebody going into a dissociocratic altered state to create safety. Um, and that is because of their perception, their experience of what I might be offering in terms of a threat. It's not mad, it's what we do to each other all the time. Some of you will be <coughs> watching this and thinking, gosh, he's talking a load of nonsense. And you might look at yourself and think, wow, I wonder what he's feeling at the moment. I might equally do the same to you sometime. So the, the, it's about what I'm noticing that I feel when I listen to your story, not thinking I know your story because you've told it to me. So first of all, we need to attune and we need to be available to your own sense of being in the moment. And how might our sense of being have fed or, or contributed to the person to set themselves at variance from you? And we all, most of us here will know about sort of Freudian ideas of transference and counter-transference, which are important. But suppose I'm not talking about me representing a person, I'm talking about my presence representing enough of a threat that a person needs to alter their state of consciousness unconsciously, of course, into this dissociocratic state, which represents as thought blocking or paranoia or confusion or disorganization or voices or the language that's currently used as psychosis, but actually I'm suggesting is quite clearly more a form of loss of primary consciousness of dissociation, as Stephen Forbes would, would call it. So are we impeding the space for a person to embrace and be connected to themselves and others? Have I done something that's necessitated they fill the space between me and them in this dissociocratic way and i'll just give you a quick example someone came to see me once and it was a, a, a yoga teacher ayurvedic practitioner and a practitioner of ahimsa or non-violence very committed person in those journeys and their intentions and we're talking away and everything's going okay i've seen this person before and i crossed my leg over my other leg and rested my foot on my other foot and very quickly this woman put her hands over her ears and was quite distressed and became quite tearful so there was clearly a stress response both the sort of uh, um, central nervous response and, and then more broadly the voices started and she was said to, before by others to be so cutting. anyway i waited and i looked and reflected was it that happened there that was quite sudden quite strange and i noticed my foot on top of the other and i said oh what do you feel about, is it, was that worrying that I put my foot on top of the other and she nodded and I said, oh, would you like me to take my foot off my other foot? And she said, yeah, yeah, would you? 
And over the next five or so minutes, she, her body regulated. We didn't do anything. We sat quietly. And, and I said, oh, I wonder if you're able to tell me a bit about what happened there. And she said, and I, she said well, my voice has got louder. And said, you're going to hurt me. And I said, oh, and it was when I put my foot on the other foot. And she said, yeah, my voice has said, if you were willing to hurt your foot that was under the other one, then you might be willing to attack me. Now, you might say that that's psychotic and delusional, but to me it felt um, very attuned to her sense of nonviolence and ahimsa. And it also was just a little moment that I might have missed. But actually, when I was able to explore that with her, we both had a great knowledge of what constitutes threat and safety of relationship. And her voice just didn't exist anymore. So it wasn't some sort of biological disease state that was coming and going. It was particularly environmental. So what do we, how does this look in the kind of therapeutic milieu? Well, we go back to this idea, you've got two people, you've got the trauma, the dissociation of cares and the, and the meaning, and they occur between the two people. And you can see in the middle of this diagram that human connection is um, very minimal in this and quite hard to get to. So the aim of this approach is to get to that human connection being front and center and the other things being less needed in the way to create safety. So then we can see psychosis or dissociocratic states as an expression of what is not safe in relationship. It's telling us that something's not safe. And communicating fear. Um, and traditionally, this is going to frighten the supporter. So the person on the left, of course, is going to need to get rid of the person on the right psychotic phenomena because we've been told there's something inherently wrong with it and this is the sort of first part of how we miss the human connection is that the person is offering us their gift of communication that they don't feel safe but they are here with us so probably would like to feel safe at some level so we notice what the threat was and we develop right understanding and this this is taken directly from some uh, uh, buddhist ideas but particularly from long paul Samedo, a teacher of mine uh, and particularly within the Four Noble Truths around um, developing right understanding for the Eightfold Path so that we become uh, more aware of what is. Um, and one of the approaches we use to this is just listening, where we spend time offering justice to listen and understand what's happening in a person's experience, rather than us taking the position that we know what's happening. Um, and what this does, of course, is that us sitting passively and calmly allows the person to consider coming back into connection without so much of all that stuff in between. And a way to think about this is waiting, pausing, stopping, and noticing that, oh gosh, I'm feeling agitated that this person's expressing these experiences. That might be the very moment where we need to sit back. And I notice my hand, one of the ways I think about that, when I'm trying to change a person's reality or involve myself in a person's reality, I put my hand on my chest and push myself back as a gesture of noticing that I, I don't actually need to intervene at this point. Uh, and that's something that people might accept or not accept, but that's part of this model. So we need to facilitate the person in staying where they are or coming towards the other when the person's ready and not going towards them. So we are not taking the first steps to correcting this. We're not taking the first steps of metaphorically or literally going towards someone and creating further threat, pushing someone further towards liminal spaces and therefore towards annihilation and what I was talking about earlier about ceasing to exist, so therefore disconnecting in what I would say is a dissociocratic state. Um, and if we think about the liminal person, liminality theory is, is really rather wonderful in this, uh, in this idea because it says that people who fall betwixt and between the structures of society and don't feel connected become liminal and then they become more ritualistic uh, um, and more creative and ritualism and creativity can look a lot like psychosis of course when in fact it might actually be a mechanism of trying to find a way back into connection in society and of course if we look at different cultures it's one of the easiest ways that we as different cultures might judge that someone has a problem when in fact they might have their very meaningful ways of making sense of something and coming back into connection. So we can take an awful lot from understanding the differences in cultures and what, how that presents to us. Um, one, just one word here, at this point we're really trying to create a space where social connection from a, from a polyvagal theory might happen. So people are in this dissociative state because dissociocratic state because social connection has has not been safe enough for them so we're really sort of trying to facilitate staying where we are so people can come back into connection 
And as you can see, this diagram just expresses this human connection is growing. We're still sitting still and the person in distress might actually begin gently to come towards us metaphorically, to come to express a little bit less of the trauma, dissociation and meaning and dissociopathic states or psychosis and, and think about what human connection might feel like. At this point, we begin to start sharing the initial little moments of the same realities or a coexisting same experience. I'll touch on more and facilitating a moment when the threat doesn't exist quite the same way. You think of that last diagram, the person's kind of just testing out whether I can be more consciously in relationship with you. And the person might, will, will inherently experience less of a liminality. And at that point, their story can emerge. It's, it's little bits. We, we don't need to rush this and jump in quickly. And many of the models we have are about KPIs and outcomes and moving people through systems. This model for me will be a much longer term, meaningful, uh, justice-based solution and, and in the long term of course would mean less people access mental health services so it is a paradigm shift in that respect um, and what we see is that we're going to start to have a kind of coexisting same experience which is a different experience of the same moment and in this process we see that trauma dissociation and meaning is evaporated in terms of being between us there's elements of psychosis there and you'll hear these what I think are rather ridiculous statements in mental health about residual uh, psychosis. I don't know what that means uh, really, other than using language to justify something or other. But actually we're saying that no, people are still hearing voices a little bit because there's still threat around. Uh, but the human connection is emerging and people have moved into those trusting, safe enough relationships and the evaporation is occurring. Uh, and so then the supporter on the left might observe and follow the, the person in distress in coming together. Um, and then we create some knowing that we're both observing each other. And that takes us into being with. Lauren Mosher, the incredible American psychiatrist, talks about being with, not doing to. And so here we're looking at, we don't need to do anything to the other person. We need to be with them and invite them to be with us. Uh, so they don't need to do anything to us to keep themselves safe. We don't need to do anything to them. And, and then we begin to explore this coexisting same experience, as we call it in that paper I referenced uh, by myself and Sharon, where we have different unique realities and they allow evaporation of the so-called psychotic state and love to emerge in a human connectedness. And what do I mean by a coexisting same experience? It's perfectly okay for someone to, one person to hear voices and another person to say they can't hear voices. There doesn't inherently need to be conflict and dissonance in that. They're just I and mean, if we can emerge to the fact that we can live safely by having different realities of the same moment, we begin to coexist without needing to impress and push on each other um, and change one another's states for our own needs of safety or ideological perception, whether there's something right or something wrong. And I was discussing with someone today in a very simple exercise, if you ask someone where they're safe, uh, hut on a hill might be and, and, and whether they're going to live in isolation and be safe, live with their dog or their cats or their food or whatever, their loved one, and it's all safe and everything's good. And I was talking to an Australian woman and I'm English and when we both sat and spent a couple of minutes imagining this, we both described what we were thinking and she was describing um, a house on a scrubland with trees all around her and all the native Australian animals and I was describing a green English hill, rolling hills down to my favourite surf beach in Cornwall. There was not an animal in sight and it was very damp and wet. So you can see we have different realities uh, um, within the same coexisting fantasy of a nice, safe, quiet place. Now that's a metaphor for the broader idea of whether we need to get rid of psychosis or whether we experience it, it the same. But it's an important thing to think about, I think, when we decide we need to change somebody else's reality. So what does that start to look like? Well, it starts to look like, okay, we're sharing difference, but we're in human connection now. We're connected, we're safe together, and we don't really need to do anything other than maintain that relationship. Um, thinking about connection then, what does that do? Well, it, it, it has a neurobiological component in terms of calming some of the systems and, and allowing the increase of dopamine and, and the online process of motivation and achieving goals and moving towards what we need and want in the future. Uh, and compassion focused therapy for psychosis is a great exponent of this. Um, and it's a shared experience of human to human and interconnectedness and right understanding of one another 
towards authoring and reauthoring the unique human narrative of being as a universal capacity. And I would really say that if you think about us telling a psychotic person so-called that they're psychotic, they might think you're psychotic because their reality and your realities are equally as strongly held. And I think in mental health services, that is no more better exposed, that there really simply isn't this wonderful difference of illness and wellness, but there is different people's realities of the same. And if we come into human connectedness through coexisting same experiences, we find this incredible connection and both have new stories. Um, you can't see these slides probably, but I'll send the slides out. And the reason I've included this slide is because I just wanted to finish by saying this model can be applied to everything. So starting in the left hand side corner, I've got the same model as depression going down, same model as anxiety, same model as PTS, or as some people will want to refer to it, PTSD. Same model as suicide. Are people splitting themselves off? I was talking to a dear friend of mine the other day, a colleague and conspirator, I suppose, a peer worker, Suze, and um, we had this incredible conversation about there's an innate desire to survive and exist. So what is happening when someone seeks to end their own life and gets absorbed in this idea? And is that not a form of dissociation, separating off, disuniting, from companionship to self. So we can very much, very easily see this as a kind of dissociocotic state where there is nothing left. So we begin to have this breaking away from self and society. So what do people need in that? Presumably they need to come back into coexistence uh, in a way that's the responsibility of the helper to not impede on the person's ability to feel safe in relationship rather than asking them to change. Down the bottom, we've got the same model as an understanding model. So you can have trauma association, meaning people can have wonderful understanding. On the right hand side, we've got bipolar, OCD and BPD. And of course, all of those uh, three on the right hand side are seen as these very invasive, difficult, hard to treat, hard to work through problems. But perhaps if we're not looking through a lens of um, equality and uh, mutuality then we see difference to the other and it does become quite hard to work through that uh, so instead we can see in the middle human connection and dissociocotic uh, framework as a way to understand how we can embrace people's realities not as madness or as illness but as meaningful ways of um, connected 